I just reimagine just having those conversations with my parents, whether I was getting yelled at or whether I was doing something good, like just to have that again, just like just five minutes, if that's what it was, just, just to have that again with my mom, my dad, just that's all I want. This is Antonio Armstrong Jr., or AJ. On July 29th, 2016, he was accused of shooting his parents, Don and Antonio, to death. To this day, he denies it, claiming that an intruder snuck into his Bel Air home and shot his parents while he slept. The jury is so hung on the verdict that AJ has had two mistrials and is in the middle of the longest one yet right now. What's the truth behind that harrowing night in July 2016? Is AJ guilty? And why would he murder his own parents? Let's explore the full story and see if we can reach a verdict. Today's story begins in Bel Air, Texas, a 17,000 people home in the Houston metropolitan area. Bel Air is quite a desirable place to live, and in many ways, the Armstrongs were an all-American family. Antonio Armstrong had grown up in Houston and studied at Texas A&M with a full scholarship to play football. In the 1990s, Antonio went on to the NFL where he was a linebacker for the Miami Dolphins. But you know how a simple injury could end a sports career? Sadly, that was Antonio's story too. He had a series of ankle injuries that made him leave the NFL and join the CFL, the Canadian Football League, for another six years. After all of this was said and done, he and his wife Dawn bought and ran first class training in Bel Air, Texas. Antonio worked as a personal trainer and a motivational speaker. I want you to pick back up those visions and those dreams that you once had. When Antonio met Dawn, she already had a son, Josh, from a previous relationship. But the three of them became a happy family easily, with Josh really looking up to his stepfather and Antonio discovering he really loved kids. In 2000, the newlywed pair had Antonio Jr., known to all as AJ. Four years later, Kayra was born. By the time AJ and Kayra were in school, Josh was old enough to leave for college, so the four of them made up the Armstrong family. And they were super united. AJ took after his dad, playing football and earning Earning himself the nickname Big Man on campus. The family followed him at all important events and supported him in whatever he wanted to do. Don and Antonio also seemed to be deeply in love, even after spending some two decades together. On July 24th, 2016, Don gushed about her husband on Facebook. This guy is my everything. He completes me in every way. He's my best friend. And after almost two decades, it's the simple things that make us happy. Five days later, Dawn and her husband would be dead. At around 10 p.m. on July 28, 2016, 12-year-old Kayra turned on the home security system for the night. Everyone was going to their bedrooms and turning in. Well, AJ didn't go to bed until after 1 a.m. He was in his loft room on the second floor texting with his girlfriend. His last text was sent just after one o'clock. Half an hour later, he called the emergency services. He'd heard gunshots coming from his own house, and when he checked his parents' bedroom, the door was open. Open, which was unlike them. He was worried about his parents, but he was too scared to go into the room and check on them. It sounds like a handgun rifle or shotgun. I'm not giving up. I'm not AJ's 911 call is mostly inaudible, but among the lines that can be decoded was AJ talking to himself, wondering how someone could have made it into the house without sounding the alarm and complaining about a ringing in his ear. Can you hear anything else that's going on? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. The dispatcher thought it was strange that he said that, but she didn't ask him to elaborate on it. After spending 16 minutes on the phone with the dispatcher, AJ turned off the home security system and exited the house together with his little sister. The police were outside their house. First, the police officers rushed into the house to confirm there wasn't an intruder present. As soon as they gave the all clear, the paramedics ran to the master bedroom. Both Dawn and Antonio had been shot in the head and had pillows over their faces. 
faces. Dawn was pronounced dead at the scene, but Antonio was still struggling to breathe. However, there was nothing the doctors could do to repair his fatal brain damage. And the entire waiting room was packed with people from everywhere. And you saw Antonio. He was on a ventilator. I, I, I told him goodbye. It was clear he wasn't going to make it. No, we knew it. I told him to fight. You know, that he's a fighter. But we knew, we knew what the situation was. Antonio died in the hospital later that night. In the kitchen, the detectives found drawers hanging open, but no possessions were missing. It looked as though someone was looking for something. On the kitchen counter, there was a gun and a note. The note was written in a very creepy way. I have been watching you for some time, get me? The gun was identified as Antonio's gun, which as AJ stated, was usually kept in the drawer of his bedside table. So whoever had shot him knew where he kept his gun. Also, they'd retrieved it so quietly, Antonio didn't even wake up. Antonio and Don were sleeping when they were shot. If it wasn't for the serious home security system, the police might have thought twice. But to the officers at the scene, the situation was quite clear. The alarm was set for every external door, and there were motion detectors for movement inside the home. There was no way for an intruder to break into the house and move inside it without the alarm going off. When the police arrived at the scene, all doors were still locked, with the screens still secured. And the murder weapon? Well, it was on the kitchen counter. Why hadn't the killer taken it with him? So as far as the police were concerned that night, there were only two murder suspects, AJ and Kara. Now, AJ was heard on the 911 call waking up his sister to get her out of the house. So she was never treated like a suspect. However, AJ was arrested that night. In cases where children kill their parents, or parasite cases, what's the most frequent motive? According to the Parasite Prevention Institute, 38% of all parasite cases committed by people under 24 stem from issues of control. In other words, the teen's possessions or freedom are taken away as punishment, and this is their revenge for it. The second most frequent reason is that the teenager wants their parents' life insurance. Believe it or not, this is more likely than the desire to stop abuse. Yeah, that's the third reason. Only 15% of young offenders who kill their parents come from abusive homes with a proven record. And 86% of parent killers are male. Sadly, the percentage is the same for adult killers. So on the morning of July 29th, 2016, AJ was interrogated and the investigators wanted to understand his relationship with his parents. You get along with your mom, you get along with dad, no problems. Me and dad are really close. And then me and my mom, like we, I mean, me, like me, my brother and my sister like had our, AJ denied having issues with Dawn, but the investigators noted something concerning. AJ had just lost both his parents to murder, yet he didn't show an ounce of emotion. The detectives knew they had to press AJ for more family information. Now you have an older brother that doesn't live there? No, he's not. He just moved, he was going to uh, Berlin and he's, he just moved back like three weeks ago. He's going to the, the Art Institute now okay. and he lives in those apartments. Like our house is here and when you come out and make that left on Maple Ridge, he's, he lives in those apartment complexes right there. Okay, so right around the corner. Yeah, right around the corner. Right right now, how, how is his relationship with everybody in the family? Uh, I mean, he's really, like me, him and my dad are like a really close group. Like we sit down and talk a lot. And then him and my mom were like, identical people, like their personalities are the same, so they're close. The detectives had seen Josh that night. Right after calling 911, AJ called his older brother and told him to come to the crime scene. Josh lived a few minutes away, so he came quickly. The cops noted that the brothers were close and were wondering if maybe the two were hiding something dark, but the investigators couldn't ask that straight away. They had to know if the brothers were indeed close. And then me and him were just like, have a really close brother relationship. Okay. Sister, like, Confirmed. However, apart from an overall lack of distress, the investigators had nothing on AJ. And the crime scene was just as mysterious. The forensics team found no fingerprints other than the Armstrongs, and there were no fingerprints on the gun or the note. The only thing the team retrieved from the scene were the shell casings found in the master bedroom and in AJ's bedroom. Wait, why were there casings in his bedroom? You know what kind of gun it is? I just know it's like a pistol. 
I think it's a 22, I'm not like 100% positive, but like, I'm only, only time I've ever like used it was when we went to the gun range when I was like eight years old or something like that, but like that's about it. And he can't, I know he, he has a case, he has his case in one of his drawers, and like my dad, his drawers, the closet, and under the bed is like off limits, so like, I've never gone in there or like seen it or anything like that, except for when he brings it out. So like, I don't know where he was keeping the gun, gun at the time, but I know he keeps it on one of those three places. AJ feigned ignorance, but the police had found a bullet hole going from AJ's floor into his parents' bedroom ceiling. Also, there were bullet holes in a pillow and a blanket in his room. When the cops confronted him with this information, AJ said something along the lines of, okay, you got me. I was fooling around with the gun together with a friend. Uh, it was like two, three, like, two, maybe three weeks ago. Like, uh, me and one of my friends was just, like, playing around, and they were, they were about to leave, and he was like, hey, uh, well, not really, he, he was like me, I was like, hey, like, have you ever tried that before? And they were like, nah, I've never done it, and I was like, you want me to show you how to? Wait a minute, didn't he say he'd only shot a gun at a shooting range when he was eight? And, like, I, like, went and checked in three places, and the gun was on my dad's bed, and I, like, laid, uh, the pillow. I laid my pillow and then like two, a blanket over it, a blanket under it, thinking like that would stop it, but I, I guess it did not stop it. AJ's sudden story change was dubious enough. And when the police looked into the story, it turned out to be bogus. There were bits from the hole he'd made in the ceiling visible on the floor of his parents' bedroom. So there was no way that bullet had been fired two or three weeks prior to the murder. His parents would have noticed. You're explaining the way around that you shot through the floor two or three weeks ago and we've got fresh sheet on the ground and we've got a round still laying on the ground. I mean, your parents use that room constantly. They're going to notice. If your dad's going to notice I and mean, he's on the carpet, he's going to notice. I'm, like, I, that's why I'm, I'm saying it doesn't make sense because it wasn't, it wasn't in his past. I don't, I'm pretty sure it wasn't in the past. If it wasn't this week, then it was last week. Sure, and there's more. There was also a bit of carpet on the first floor that appeared to have been burnt. According to the forensics team, it seemed like someone had poured a bit of gasoline and attempted to light the area with a single match. The carpet did not catch fire, but the burn was recent and the smell of gasoline was still strong. Of course, AJ was confronted about this too. Was the carpet burnt? Uh, that was Tuesday. Did you, um, use, did, you, did you spill anything on the floor before? No, I didn't spill anything on the floor. That's the, that's the thing that was like confusing to me. I didn't spill anything on the floor. What's the big, what's the bottle around the alcohol that's empty in your bedroom? Uh, I don't know. I'm just asking because the other investigator that was out there says that the floor right there smells like accelerant, which is like sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I know, like that. Like that. Like that. that. Yeah, right. That's what, that's what me and my, because me and my dad, when like it happened, we both said that it like smelled like gas somewhere and we didn't know where it was coming from. But the police didn't confirm that Antonio Sr. ever had noticed that burn mark too or discussed it with his son. Had AJ tried to burn the house with his family inside before the murder? The fact that he'd fired his dad's gun through a pillow and blankets sometime before the murder only indicated more preparation. Perhaps AJ had tested the gun and its noise, wanting to see if Kara would hear it from her room downstairs. This was a pretty grim scenario, but in the eyes of the police, it was pretty clear. However, after spending eight months in juvie jail, 16-year-old AJ was released on a $200,000 bond. Until this day, he remains free. AJ's case was pretty tough from the get-go. Many clues were pointing at his involvement in the murder, but the lack of physical evidence was overwhelming. AJ didn't have gunpowder residue anywhere on him on the night of the murder. None of his parents' blood or DNA was found on him either. It didn't appear like he'd changed his clothing before calling 911 either. There were no cleaning products in sight either, so AJ wouldn't have tried to clean himself up after murdering his parents. Or if he did, he was extremely savvy about it. During his first trial, AJ's interrogation was played. According to AJ, not only was he sure there was an intruder in his home that night, but he'd also seen a man wearing a mask. That's when I came down and I kind of looked, because you know how like, my, it has the little, it goes down, like you can peek real quick and see like what's like going on from down from my stairs. And like I saw someone like coming out so I just took off back up stairs and went straight to my closet. And I was like, I'm going to call her. And I was like, I'm going to call her. 
What do you did you physically see somebody? Or no, I saw him running. Like I saw him running. Uh, or is it, is it he or she? Or? It's a, definitely, it was definitely a guy. It wasn't a girl. There wasn't like long hair or anything like that. I mean, they had a, a, it was like a mask and like you could only see the eyes and the mouth, but he looked like a, he looked like a black guy, but I'm not like 100% positive, but I'm pretty sure it was an African American. And like, I'd say like six feet. Maybe. However, this was never verified, and the police couldn't gather any suspects that would have the motive to kill the Armstrongs. Interestingly enough, even with so many clues pointing at AJ as the killer, his extended family was very supportive of him. Even his grandparents, whose children were just killed, insisted AJ was innocent. We have stood by our grandson's side every day since 2016. Everyone in the family fully supports him and believes in his innocence and the charges. Our family thought and grieves. <laughs> he was facing life in prison with a minimum of 40 years before parole, and his family did not want to see AJ waste his life like that. Kara also stood by her brother's side, arguing that the home security system was faulty and that other people could have broken into the house, especially people who knew the family. For one thing, the home's alarm system was faulty or finicky, as Kara referred to it, saying it would malfunction at times. Kara also testified friends, family, a lot of people people had key code access to the house by way of a garage door. From there, a door to the house was always unlocked, Kara testified, but perhaps key to Kara's testimony was what she had to say about her oldest brother, Joshua Armstrong, testifying Josh had changed after moving in with the family in May of 2016. Josh had moved minutes away from his family just three weeks before the murder, after changing colleges. According to Kara, he was like a different person when he moved back. Now the defense asking Kara Kara, when Josh came back from college, did you notice anything strange about him? Kara's response, he had become extremely like he was there, but he wasn't there. He was kind of distant, and I observed he acted like he was the black sheep of the family. Could Josh have murdered his parents? Another interesting testimony came from AJ's aunt, Renee. Renee worked at one of the gyms Don and Antonio owned and testified that in August 2016, two weeks after the murders, two people broke into the gym. There was CCTV footage to confirm it. So the defense used that that to paint the scenario that someone was targeting the Armstrong family with a vengeance. AJ's girlfriend, Kate, was also very supportive of him throughout the lengthy process. She was adamant that AJ was innocent and criticized the police for harassing him. However, when she took the stand, the prosecution caught her up on several little lies. This didn't help AJ too much. Remember how AJ and Kate texted well into the night of his parents' murder? They texted because she said, AJ was trying to quash a rumor about her another boy started. But when prosecutors had their chance, they tried to prove AJ was lying to her, and that set a new tone. The prosecution wanted Kate to admit that she knew there were problems between AJ and his parents. Kate kept saying she didn't remember, but the prosecution kept pulling files and files of texts between the two, where AJ was complaining and cussing at his parents. They pointed out how in one exchange, he was upset AJ was selling and smoking too much pot. Another exchange from when AJ was in juvie jail. Kate was upset. AJ lied to her about the reason he was kicked out of Kincaid. Quote, I feel like you lie to me all the time. It gets darker. In the courtroom, several messages between AJ and his mother were revealed. Indeed, he did not have a good relationship with her in 2016. In fact, she was pretty disappointed in him over and over again. Both Dawn and Antonio expressed their anger at how AJ was lying to them about his grades and school performance and called him a disappointment. This is a text Antonio sent his son in April of 2016. AJ, I am sick of getting reports about silly you are doing. Keep screwing up and doing silly things like speed through the park. I am trading your car in for one that fits your maturity. Last warning. In June, Don wrote to him, we gave you our all and the best we had. We wanted the best for you. We provided the best education, bought you a car to celebrate you. We tried to be open with you and what was important to you. And all you do is lie to us, scheme behind our backs. You choose to piss on all we try 
tried to do. It hurts tremendously and I am beyond disappointed. On June 3rd, 2016, Antonio and Don confronted their son about several Ds he'd received in school. He also hadn't been readmitted to the Kincaid School for the fall because of his performance, according to administrators and coaches who have testified throughout the trial. Antonio was also upset that he'd paid thousands of dollars for AJ's tutors, but he continued to flunk school, sell drugs, and put his and others' lives in danger with his new car. He responded to their text, I'm not even going to try and say sorry for everything because right now I know my word doesn't mean anything to you guys. I put myself in the absolute worst possible position with not only school, but with the way you guys think about me. I know I have gone to another level with my actions and I know I need a major life change right now. And around the same time, there was a troubling text exchange between AJ and Kate. When Kate asked him why he didn't respond the other night, AJ wrote, oh, I was playing with matches and dropped one and some of the carpet caught on fire and I blamed my sister. Okay. What did the defense attorney have to say? Um, there was a lot of talk about all these texts. They're 16 year olds. They're 16 year old kids flirting with each other. Once again, it's a attempt by the prosecution to come up with some sort of motive and it's just not there. There is no motive. According to him, AJ murdering his parents that night would have been too sudden as he'd shown normal behavior that day. He's having text messages with his girlfriend, I love you, I miss you, sweetie, all that 16 year old mushy stuff. And then all of a sudden he executes his parents. It's nonsense. But any true crime enthusiast knows some killers show perfectly calm and calculated behaviors even as they take dozens of lives. In fact, these are the ones that don't get caught. To this day, AJ's family insists that he is simply not the type to commit murder. We know our grandson. Yes. We know what he's capable of doing yes. and what he's not capable of doing. No. Now we know that he's not capable of murdering his mother and his father. AJ himself appearing on TV, insisting he is the victim of some shocking allegations. Somebody else in the house that night in the know that this is something I'm being accused of, just makes everything so much worse. Dealing with not having my parents anymore, it's the fact that I'm being accused of something of this magnitude. It only gets weirder from here on out. Maxine, a family friend, claimed that Antonio Sr. had once been involved in a prostitution ring together with her husband. Both of them had received death threats from some dodgy people in the ring. And according to her, these would have been the people who killed Antonio and Don. That there was a prostitution ring that my husband, Antonio, and another individual were all involved in during this time. I'm nervous that the more I push or the more I share, like that it can end up the way Antonio was. The names that I'm giving you, I know for a fact, based on the call records and based on what I've seen. So I don't know, like, do I, is there a prostitution police? Like, I don't know, like, what we do. I know his son is obviously the suspect right now. Um, but the, that whole thing is just shady. But when the police officially interviewed Maxine, she refuted her claims. After a short investigation, no evidence was found that Antonio had been involved in a ring or that he'd received death threats. When that theory fell, the defense team went after Josh. Now, Kara had testified that he had changed after college, but there was a sadder reality to his change. Josh had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. For the past three years, He's been in and out of a psychiatric facility. You're gonna hear evidence that he's You're gonna hear evidence that he's homicidal. You're gonna hear evidence that he's catatonic. You're gonna hear evidence that he has a woman in his head that he's trying to kill. Josh's ex, Hannah, testified that she was sleeping next to Josh at the time of the murders. However, after the murders, Josh spiraled down a rabbit hole of paranoia and obsession, eventually checking himself in to a psychiatric ward. Pairing Josh's psychiatric record with Kara's testimony that he felt unloved by his parents led the defense attorney down a new theory. Josh was angry with his parents for loving his younger siblings more. He'd felt like the black sheep for quite some time and he'd been planning this revenge 
ever since moving to the neighborhood again. And as Kara stated, he could have entered the house that night via the garage door keypad without triggering the finicky alarm system. But then why did AJ lie so much? He lied to his parents, his girlfriend, and to the police. Dawn literally wrote this to her husband about AJ. He doesn't care about anything. He is a bold faced liar like I have never seen before. AJ didn't take the stand in his defense. 19 hours later, a hung jury resulted in a mistrial. And accordingly, because of that, the court declares a mistrial. It was frustrating. I was hurt. I was really upset. And I had built my faith. I was so adamant on the idea that I knew this was going to be it. Like no one could convince me anyway, like anything else that this this was gonna be it for me. AJ would have two more trials. The COVID-19 pandemic delayed the second trial to 2022. By then, AJ already had a son of his own, Hendrix. This time, the defense team went harder after Josh, but the prosecution argued that Josh's schizophrenia got much worse after the murders. Also, the clean, calculated murders of Dawn and Antonio were not consistent with someone suffering a psychotic episode. This time, the prosecution also showed a detailed tracking of AJ's phone that night. After texting Kate goodnight, his phone screen was turned on several times without the phone being unlocked. According to the prosecution, AJ was using it to light up the dark hallways up to his parents' bedroom. At 1.25 a.m. that night, the monitor sensor in the kitchen was activated. This would be consistent with the gun and note being left on the counter. AJ called 911 at 140, which would have given him 15 minutes to clean up the scene. The defense responded to that with a record showing 77 errors in the home security system over time. That meant in their eyes that one, the house could have easily been broken into, two, the kitchen motion sensors could be lying. The prosecution then mentioned AJ complaining about ringing in his ears on his 911 call. And there's this amazing thing is if you fire a gun, without ear protection, something happens to your ears. That wouldn't happen if you're in another room. The whole reason why we have ear protection is there's like a high pitch or a ringing that goes on in your ears. When the dispatcher asked him, do you hear any noises? What does AJ Armstrong say? Do you hear anything else going on? Yeah. Um, It's not even like he's talking to her. He's whispering it slowly wrote to himself. He's saying, it's high-pitched in my ears. And if AJ claimed he'd seen another man in the house, why didn't he say this to the dispatcher that night? In 2019, eight jurors thought AJ was guilty, while four thought he wasn't. In 2022, eight people thought he was innocent. So again, there was a mistrial. And he said that he saw something run, someone running down the stairs. It was clearly made up, it was dark. He said he was African-American wearing a mask. Well, it was dark. And if it truly was your brother, Josh, wouldn't you recognize his physique? In June, 2023, AJ's third trial is set to begin at a different location. As of May, 2023, the jurors still aren't selected. AJ is now an active dad and continues to fight for his freedom, along with the same defense team as when he was 16. His family remains by his side too, with Kara pointing at Josh as a more likely suspect. The Houston police are 100% he is the killer. They just can't prove it. But will we ever get a verdict for AJ? And do you think he's guilty? Thanks for watching, you guys. What do you think? Guilty or innocent? Let me know down in the comment section. And before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and click that bell button so you never miss a new episode. See you next time.